Welcome to Synced On Air. I'm your host, Angelique Robb, and today I have a guest from the West Coast, Mr. Gary Kraus. How are you, Gary? I am fine. I'm doing great. How about great. you? I am doing well, although a bit wet today. <laughs> Same here. It's, we got rain and we need it. Oh, good, good. Well, yeah. um, I think, so you're up in Oregon. And right. you've been hit with this record snow lately. Um, you bet. You bet. Sounds like, um, yeah, it's presented a few challenges for you recently, yeah. has it? <laughs> well, it's kind of hard to uh, work on landscape projects when you've got a, several feet of snow on the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I which imagine. Is, <laughs> yeah, which is not very common here. We only get snow at higher elevations, so the snow level drop way down into the valley floors. Okay. And thank goodness we got a snow and ice uh, 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 equipment, so we've been busy doing that. Okay, good. Yeah, your backup plan. So um, yeah. that is good that you have that capability because otherwise, yeah, kind of kind of stuck. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, Gary, I recognize your name. It's so nice to actually have a discussion with you because you I've. I've seen you join into some of our calls, our webinars. Right. So right. Um, love that I, I get to meet you, albeit not face-to-face, right. -face, but kind of face-to-face, yeah. um, virtually right. face-to-face. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love your magazine, uh, I, you know, because it's, it's, it's kind of designed for people like me, for businesses like mine, well, design, design let, build, yeah. design well, build, let's... maintain, that's what we do. That's awesome. our core business. Well, how did you get started in the industry? Let's let's rewind a bit and give people okay. a bit of your, you know, how you got okay. into this and, and where well, you are today. Yeah, well, in uh, 1974, I, uh, fin I finished grad school and moved up to Oregon. So all my... What did you graduate I, in? Uh, interdisciplinary studies. Okay. So... Uh, I was going to San Francisco State University, so my friends, when I told them I was leaving for Oregon, they thought I had lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and are you from uh, California? Well, or I'm not from California, but I was going to college there. Okay, so I where are you from? I did my bachelor's degree at Arizona State University because my okay. family had moved there, but I was born in Pennsylvania, southwest Pennsylvania. Oh, so all over the place. Okay. Yeah. So why Oregon? Why did you move to Oregon? Uh, well, you know, that's interesting because when I was going to grad school, I had a friend whose mother owned property up here in Southern Oregon in the Applegate Valley. Okay. And I said, you know, I, I'm done living in the city because I'm from a small town. You know, I grew up in a very small town, rural area. Um, and so uh, I wanted to kind of get back to that. So a friend of mine said, oh, check out my mom's property up in the Applegate. So long story short, I ended up buying land here in Southern Oregon in the Applegate. Okay. And lived here ever since. <laughs> Amazing. Well, yeah. so you knew once you got there that that was your home. Yep, exactly. The energy uh, it just was perfect for me, you know. Okay. Oh, well, I haven't been up that way. I'll have to come up that yeah. way then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have to, you have to, because uh, if you uh, look, Google uh, Applegate Valley, Southern yeah, Oregon, uh, you'll, you'll absolutely want to come and visit. Yeah. But please come and visit. Don't plan to stay. <laughs> That's our Oregon motto. Don't want us to spoil it, huh? We do, you don't want to be inundated with people. <laughs> well, yeah, or Oregonians are kind of funny. They like, uh, you know, they like people to come and visit, but we don't want to become Californicated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for setting us straight on that. <laughs> yeah. You bet. <laughs> well, okay. So now, how did yeah. you end up in the industry? So, so when I when I moved up here, um, uh, I got together with some people I met and became friends with, and we decided to go into the reforestation business. Okay. So we started contracting with federal government to plant trees on on logged uh, ground. It's okay. uh, It's the law. Once you take, once you harvest uh, stumpage, you have to replant it. Okay. So we had contracts with the federal government, with Weyerhaeuser, with International Paper, with fruit growers, with BLM. Wow. 
and we did that. Uh, we did the uh, reforestation work, and plus we also had a wild, wildland firefighting crew. Oh wow! Oh, that's um, a bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it is. It it's it is very dangerous, you know. But when you're twenty something, you don't think about that. Okay. Sounds like we could talk about that another yeah, another time. Yeah, but time, another time, you bet. Yeah. So the reforestation work, um, did you do that for a handful of years or uh I did it for about ten years. Okay. How many trees do you reckon you've uh I personally planted over a half a million. Wow. Wow, I that's amazing. Planted, our company planted oh probably anywhere from five to ten million trees during that time period. Fantastic. And what kinds, um, it, I guess it depended on what was being removed and you right, planted right, something, right. you planted e exactly what was being removed or uh, did you vary all, it up? To... Not, not always. It depends on what the contract called for with the government. Okay. They would call that they wanted certain trees planted in certain, uh, what we call units, uh, acreages that were logged. Okay. Okay. A lot of those, a lot of those acreages, uh, a lot of those projects that we planted, Years later, we had to go back and replant because the mortality rate was so high. Oh, okay. The That's Forest disappointing. Service, the Forest Service, in my professional opinion, didn't really know what they're doing as far as reforestation is concerned. And funny story, <laughs> I met with a silver culturist. Do you know what that is? No. A tree scientist. Okay. <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, that's what that is. Um and uh, we were looking at a specialized uh, unit that needed uh, uh, interplanting of different species and so forth. And uh, we were going over the contract specifications. And I said to him, a lot of this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem logical. He says, well, that's your first mistake, expecting the government to be logical. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, OK. Because I questioned some of the techniques and methodology that they were proposing to replant this unit. Yeah. Well, that's that's disappointing because I know that um, urban trees have a, you know, high mortality rate, too. And um, yeah, I guess. Well, let, let's keep going yeah. with your experience. Like okay. We can't cover so, too many topics in yeah, this podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Let's let's cut to the chase. Yeah. How did how did you get into because like well, you said yeah. now you're a full yeah. service landscape yeah. company. So, uh, so uh, at, you know, in Oregon, we're licensed. You have to take a state board test for the contractors board, landscape contract, et cetera. So uh, in 94, uh, uh, latter part of 94, a friend of mine in Eugene, Oregon, who was a general contractor, got a hold of me and said he had a contract with a nonprofit that got a huge several million dollar grant from the government to build assisted living homes all over Oregon. Okay. So he said, are you interested? He said, because uh, they all require landscaping. Oh, so, wow. So I said, yeah, I'm interested. He, so I got my, uh, I got my contractor's license, uh, which wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, 700 questions seven tests 700 questions everything oh, wow. from trees to construction technology to uh plants you have to know all the scientific names of plants mm -hmm. um and then uh, uh and then laws and rules and uh irrigation and backflow device you know requ uh, required yeah. uh, expertise in all those areas took me a year to you know get all the tests done get all the licensing yeah. Uh, so then after I finished that, pro I did projects all over Oregon uh, with that contract that I that's got. That's a fantastic start, isn't so it? That, to be handed. How, yeah. Right, that's how I started my business. Yeah. Um, so uh, once that project was all finished, then I, then I started working on local projects, which I didn't have a lot of money. I started this business with four hundred and fifty dollars that I actually borrowed from a friend <laughs> to get to get my back then. You for four hundred dollars, you could get your your contractor's license and your bond and your insurance. Wow, that's a bargain. Yeah. Today, today that takes about four to five thousand dollars to start a lab. I would have. Yeah. That's I would have. That's thought. without. That's without any equipment. equipment. Or tools. Yeah. 
So just to be um, licensed, yeah. just to be licensed, because in Oregon, you have to have a landscaping business has to have two licenses. They have to have a landscape construction professional, the person that took the test with the okay. state contractors board. Then that person can apply for a landscape contracting business license from the oh. landscape board okay. or go to work for another company who needs an LCP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, I've been amazed to find out how different it is from state to state. Yeah. So, um, right. you know, there's, there's a lot of states that don't have a, a landscape contractor license. That's they right. have a, a landscape horticulturist license and they have a landscape architect license, right. but they don't have a landscape contractor that's right. Yeah. Some states don't. Some states don't have any contractor licensing. Uh, so people might ask, well, why do contractors need to be licensed? It's consumer protection. Yeah. Well, and I, so. I think our industry um, needs that because um, there are a lot of people that maybe don't don't know enough to to give the guarantees that they're trying to give or right, are they right. um you know standards right. need to be upheld with standards right standards yeah. and then uh people don't want to pay somebody to get ripped off because they don't do the work right exactly so they yeah. want to have some resource uh so that's you know that's kind of uh, bringing uh, professionalism into the industry it is yeah Totally and, agree, but yeah. it makes it makes it hard when all the states do something differently to, right. to have consistency across right. the U.S. Right. Um, but how did you? So, um, sounded like what a great opportunity to have this pile of work. That again, you would be working with a, a general contractor on multiple sites. How did you know how to run a business though, and 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 price uh, it and all that uh, stuff? Well, I learned a lot when I was uh, working with the uh, forestry company, you know, okay. the reforestation company, because I was one of the head people that did most of the estimating. Oh, okay. So uh, I, in fact, our local uh, landscape, Southern Oregon Landscape Association, I gave a class on estimating. Okay. Um, so uh, that's one of the biggest, uh, uh, sit, uh, biggest, uh, pro well, not problems, but biggest thing uh, a, a business owner has to learn is how to estimate properly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just like that, some a webinar that you gave, Finding the Ideal Client, uh, was that you, I think? Um, yes. It. I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to think <laughs> who gave it and when, but uh, yeah. Yeah, a um, landscape, uh, you had this woman, she was a landscape architect. I believe that was from you, not well, uh, because I get I go on webinars with uh, VectorWorks Landmark. You know about yes. that company. Yeah, I, I was going to say they're that, one of our advertisers, their, so that's right. where I recognize it. Yes. Yeah, I use their uh, their software. I've been using it for about ten years. Oh, awesome! And guess what? I'm still learning it. <laughs> well, it's a pretty um, pretty detailed software, isn't it? Yeah. To do it, to do Extreme. it well. Um, extremely you need steep, to keep learning. <laughs> right. Extremely <laughs> steep learning curve. I have an advantage in CAD, learning CAD, because uh, when I was in college, I took a drafting course. That was before okay. they had computers because I'm yeah. ancient. <laughs> so um, I, I, I come from the Stone Age. Uh, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once you learn how to draft on paper, you know, how to draw, you know, a design on paper, then uh, transitioning to CAD is a lot easier. You just need to learn how the software works. You know how yeah. the paper space is. You know about the paper space. Yeah, yeah. So and it's visualizing it too. Like it's, yeah, yeah right. if you can do that and think about it properly, because right. I've trained some landscape designers in my time and and, you know, it was like, okay, do you realize, you know, that doesn't work because you yeah. you've combined two planes. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'm 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 really glad you brought that up because here's here's my view of things. You know, a guy like me, a design build, where I have a degree in in art and design, I have a degree in discipline, interdisciplinary studies. Um, 
I understand this paper space, but as a contractor, I understand the real world. Yeah. So what you put on paper does not translate to the actual site. Now, uh, I've done it so should, many. Though. Yeah, it I've should. Done, <laughs> it should. Yeah. I've done millions of dollars worth of commercial and public works jobs where I've been presented with a, 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 a plan from an arc, a landscape architect. And uh, I, a lot of times um, I see their failing is that they. Oh, no. Okay. 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 So we're back. Let's hope uh, we don't have a problem again. Every Zoom meeting that I've been on has um, uh, has done that. Has done that. Yes. Oh, that's frustrating. Well, yeah. I, I was going to ask you if it's um, if there's bad weather or something, we could turn off our videos to help. But um, I, I let me turn off my video. That might okay. help. And I'll turn because, off mine too. And because, you know, we're only recording by voice and right. um, and we can yeah. edit out that waiting time and yeah. um, and oh, go from you there. Can? Good. Yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah. OK. So uh, it's, don't worry. it's easier. It's easier if we can actually talk face to face. I'm, but... It's nicer. But right. yeah. Um, well, let so I'll tell you where it cut off. It cut off when you said um, you were about to say the main thing. Oh, that landscape yeah. architects. <laughs> yeah, the 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 land the the main thing with landscape architects because there's some very good arch landscape architects out there, but they don't have uh, most of them don't have any experience with constructing or installing a landscape. So what looks good on paper not necessarily will work on the site. Yes, um, I don't know how many landscape architects actually visit the site before they actually do the landscape and just look at the lay of the land, even though there's nothing, you know, no building or anything going on there as, uh, when they do the plan, because they get a site plan from a architect or yeah. the, or the property zone or a survey or company yeah. or, yeah, or the, or the uh, developer who sends them the survey of all that. So they get elevations and everything, but I've never been on a project yet where we didn't have to make some changes because the site conditions um, dictated what we could do and couldn't do. So when I design, I design for the site. Agreed. I yeah. I think that's a critical um, piece that I'm I'm hearing from a lot of a lot of different companies that mm -hmm. can be missing and and I think it's it's so critical. I, so I've, and I don't know if you know, but I've owned a landscape design and build business, but in the UK. And yeah. mm -hmm. I feel like if you're not visiting the site, that you could miss out on 50% of, right. of the but, good parts right. that, you know, that you could, yeah. you could integrate into the plan. Yeah. You know, and, and part of that is actually maybe even the views of other people's property, not even right. on the site. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> like I just did a design for uh, for an industrial uh, park and uh, I found out that one of the uh, one of the buildings on the site bordered a residential. So they wanted that screened uh -huh. off and they wanted to build a fence. I said, why build a fence? Just create a, a, a shrub screen. And yeah. I recommended, uh, I, Port I think, uh, Portugal laurels. I think I recommended for it. I'll use the, either Portugal laurels or Western red cedars, depending on uh, the situation. But um, the other thing, too, is um, landscape architects, I don't, uh, I see most of the time they do not take into consideration what that landscape's going to cost to maintain. I took a course with uh, OSU. A while back, it was called Sustainable Landscape Management. Okay. And the basis of the course was how to reduce owner input, which okay. translates to mean how much, how can you lower the maintenance cost uh, for that uh, uh, and make it easier for that client to maintain their investment in the landscaping. Landscaping is worth 20% of the value of the property. So you want to you address that. 
Well, and, you know, I see the same things that like if you want, let's say, a a certain style like English country garden, you know, that it looks like it's low maintenance maybe because there's not a lot of weeding to do, but it's actually a very high, um, high maintenance. Yeah, very um, very intense maintenance on there because it's mostly you're most mostly what you're doing is uh, shaping and pruning uh, the a lot of the shrubbery. Yeah. Uh, uh, on a and constant it grows basis. quickly. Yeah. yeah. And it grows quick on a constant basis. So, uh, West, uh, we don't build many English gardens. Well, now. yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not as used to your your climate, but yeah, yeah, I could. I mean, do you? So you still have those different styles that you get asked for that are well, high high maintenance versus low maintenance. Well, uh, not usually because on design build, that's what I design. I'm okay. certified. Yeah, yeah. I showed you those certifications I have. So I'm certified, just to name a few, I'm certified in sustainable landscaping, certified in best management practices, certified in uh, zero scaping, certified in smart water irrigation. Awesome. So that's how I designed. Yeah. So, so for instance, if we're designing a, uh, I just looked at a, uh, we're doing a commercial project and I looked at the, uh, at the plan, the architect uh, sent. And I looked at, so I called the architect. I said, can I make some changes? And he said, well, what changes do you want to make? I said, where all these shrubbery, all these shrub plant beds you have, you have, uh, you have sprays on those. I want to change them to drip. So okay. he said, yeah, that's fine. What do you want to use? I told him, we like to use the Rainbird XFDE uh, line because you can run out a longer uh, length of line with less okay. stub ups. Because it, you know, you can run out almost 300 feet on one stub up. Okay. Uh, and they're they're buried uh, just below the surface. So uh, you you lower your ETO by doing that because you don't have the water doesn't sit on the surface. It it drains down in because you're not watering at uh, you're not point source watering. In other words, point sources emitters that are that are uh, next to the uh, plant. Uh, in a, a Rainbird XFD system, uh, drip system, you run a grid of tubing in that plant uh-huh. bed. Okay. And then, and then you're not wa- watering just at the plant. You're watering the whole entire the bed. The whole area. Yeah. Which, yeah. what is that? What do you think that does? It allows the roots to spread. Yeah. And then, so all these plants, the roots intertwine under the soil and if you're using uh, a good soil mat with compost, you have that mycorrhizin building up. So you have the endo and ecto mycorrhizin uh, working with all those root systems because you have moisture throughout the whole bed. Yeah. So you and get the that roots under- are reaching. Right. And, right. Yeah. And you get that under web, uh, underground web of life, what they call the web of life. Mm, yeah. You know what that is, right? Yes. Yes. Awesome. I love this. Gosh, we're getting into some education as well for the audience. Right. Well, (laughs) these are things that, uh, that, you know, if you're going to be in this business, these are things you, if you want to uh, be a uh, consummate professional, these are things you have to know. Yeah. Because if you're not, if you're not doing this kind of stuff, you're not preparing the soil properly. So the soil is the foundation of your landscaping. If you don't have good, soil properly amended and 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 proper uh proper um, uh drainage you know infiltration in the in in the soil areas um i i had it's not gonna last yeah Yeah. i had a client that i did a landscape design for the a doctor for his doctor's office then the general contractor hired this a very unqualified landscape uh, company to do it uh Three years later, I had to come back and completely redo the whole landscaping. Oh so my goodness! They had that heavy black clay, so yeah. instead of instead of uh, excavating out a lot of that out and add or adding uh, compost to to that to amend it so it creates some um, uh, friable soil, right? That can yeah. drain. The they just dug. They just dug a hole the size of a one gallon pot or whatever and stuck the plant. Oh no. In it. So when I when I went back to uh, renovate that landscaping because none of the plants were growing, I pulled the plant out and they were sitting in water. <gasps> and so oh because goodness. they had the drip system, you know, and the, they hadn't rooted out. 
And okay. so because that's a really great case study to talk about, because right. I think that we as an industry need to, you know, you need to understand so much. It, it's a complicated industry. You know, you can think yeah, it's right. straightforward, but there's there's a lot more to it. The more I learn, the more I know I need to learn. Yeah. And, and that's a really great example of yeah. we can't just dig holes no and 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 no. stick plants in yeah. that's not our yeah remit. everything our remit so yeah. much bigger than that everything is synergistic so yeah. everything is connected to everything just like in nature that's why yes. i like the, uh, doing this business because um mm -hmm. reintroducing nature back into a site where it was taken out yeah. When they build a building, what do they do? They clear the they land. They disrupt everything, they and disrupt nothing everything. is. Right. And and you have bits of um, right. dry um, drywall and laying around yeah. and nails yeah. and. <laughs> oh, oh God! I've had concrete contractors and painting contractors dump their waste, you know, their concrete slurry or their paint when they clean out their paint buckets in my plant beds. <gasps> well, oh my you can imagine how irate I got. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness well so, and you know even as part of the landscape we do have construction outside too but it's it's like I found and I'll see what your thoughts are on this like I only had a small design and build landscape residential landscape business uh -huh. but I even found that the construction you know my stone masons uh -huh. um, knew a little didn't know that much about soil and again if if we weren't talking to them up front about what they're doing to scrape the site before putting in foundations right it it, it leaded or it led to a mess oh. later whenever yeah. we were testing the soil yeah. and looking at, you right. know we'd have subsoil mixed in with topsoil and we'd need to do a lot more work right to yeah. rectify the site in the long yeah. run and you know so there, there's so many little interfaces right that need to be talked about right to yeah. get it right from right. the start right exactly and the you know the thing being is is that um i've had projects where they took all the really good topsoil off the site just took it off just took it away oh gosh and, and then, then you have to buy then, it in. <laughs> no, and then they brought in this junk soil and said, oh. use this. So I've had some big fights with general contractors over that because uh, because what they, they were, you know, I don't know if they sold the soil or what they did, but they were trying to make money off of the grading. So like, for instance, um. I did a discount tire and the landscape architect put the specifications in there for the subgrade to be 12 inches below top of grade. When okay. I got to the site, it was only four inches. Oh. And we couldn't even trench in our, our pipe because they brought in such crappy fill soil that it was so uh, it was full of rock and debris that we had to use a backhoe to create our trenches for our, our oh, irrigation because we couldn't use our trencher bar. And well, it, it cost but, the uh, it cost the owner an additional thirty thousand dollars for me to fix that. And so you couldn't, uh, you know, just in that particular contract, you weren't able to say to the client, um, the GC has not provided what he no, was he or she was yeah, supposed to well, as per yeah. the contract. That wasn't you a, have an to, avenue. You have to follow chain of command. Okay. If you understand that military term, you have to follow the uh, protocol. Uh, if I'm subcontracted on a project, I'm not allowed to deal with the client, the okay. owner. Okay. I have to, everything has to go through the general contractor. So I send him uh, either a change order or an RFI, and then he sends it to the architect, then the architect sends it to the owner, the owner gets back to the architect. Okay. That's how it works in commercial. Yeah commercial and public works projects. So, and so, so, okay. So what you're saying, the crux of that particular issue was, um, was general contractors maybe not delivering as, I can, as promised. I, right. I can say it in one word, greed. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, how do we fix this as an, 
as an well, industry issue. Then. Uh, okay, so I would advise any contractor working on a, a, one of these type of projects, stick to the specifications, <laughs> bid the specifications, make yeah. sure you have the specifications in your in your estimate. Yeah. So address the specifications, bid to the specifications, and build to the specifications. If yeah. any if any other entity, the general contractor or another subcontractor, does not want to comply to the specifications, submit an RFI or a change yeah. order in writing stating that – so good example is I went to the general contractor. I told him about the problem. And I said, I can't put in enough good soil on this site to get these plants to grow. I said, yeah. the soil, the subgrade, four inches is not enough, not enough soil for a shrub. It needs at least six to eight inches of soil. And then on the trees, what we do on the trees, because they go deeper, we dig a hole one and a half times to two times the size of the root ball. Yeah. And then we add amendments in uh, soil amendments and so forth in there. Yeah. So that that tree can get established. Most trees can live in fairly poor soils, not you know, really poor soils, but they can live in fairly poor soils if they have some good mulch around them. So if yeah. you put some aged mulch, uh, we recommend our but not against, but not up against the trunk. <laughs> no, you know, you gotta <laughs> you gotta keep that trunk that root collar above the grade. Yeah. So uh, what we do recommend to our um, residential clients is don't use bark, use compost, mulch your beds with compost because it creates a couple things. It helps introduce the, uh, the uh, microbes and the mycelium that you need in the soil, but yeah. it also helps retain moisture. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're, you're, you know, then I tell the client, well, if you want bark, you know, let the let the compost mulch uh, 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 remain for a couple of years. And then if you want to bring bark in, bring it in. Yeah. But bark bark can suck nitrogen out of the soil if it's not uh, completely composted. So well, you might as well just use compost. That's a good point. I was just um, thinking of our event. We just had our Sync Live event in Atlanta and yeah. we had them talking about one of the talks was about um green infrastructure right and you're gonna have to do your next one out here yeah i'd love to okay. <laughs> have to see that applegate valley <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> or is that maybe we maybe need to do it in a bigger city though huh? uh, i i'm not a big city guy so you know <laughs> well and and so you know to your point, I, using oh, more uh, plants for mulch, right, you know, right. and covers the soil and it, it actually yeah. can, um, you know, next, remove some yeah. of the heat island problems. Go ahead. Absolutely. absolutely. The next uh, live event you have also uh, live stream it. Well, so, that's so funny. like I like yeah. I could attend it without actually having to go there. So I've just been talking to Turfs Up Radio about live streaming our next event. So what a good lead in. Thank you for uh, for teasing that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so let's let's talk about professionalism in the industry, yes. because I see it lacking. Yeah. So, I, uh, thank you for bringing that up, because yeah, that's I one think... of the reasons I wanted to get together with you was to talk about that, because um the green industry gets a, a really bad, uh, bad rap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of bad actors. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but there are. And, I agree. And they don't follow standards set up in the industry. Now, that said, there's no building codes for landscaping. In, well, in and that's 90 maybe part of the, of the problems. Yeah. That but, could be. But, but what that could be? But let's, from your point of view, this was one of my questions. Yes. What what can we do? Because synced, we want to be um, an education source, and we want to right. appeal to those companies that, you know, maybe they can't afford to, you know, do their um, contractor license just yet, and they're they're working up to it. But then, you know, we could provide through our publication, through free resources on our on the website or social mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. we can provide some of those resources without costing um, the thousands yet. So, right. what 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 do you think is needing addressed today? Well, I uh, you know uh, that's why I brought up the professionalism. 
because there's uh, so many uh, discrepancies in what is uh, the proper method methodology and techniques for landscape design and landscape construction. One okay. of the one of the things that I I see that's not being addressed is basic standards for landscape construction, which is not universally adopted. So everybody's got a different. You know, if you uh, call 10 contractors to get an estimate for a project, you'll get 10 different uh, viewpoints, 10 different uh, opinions. Plans and, and plans yeah. to you know, build. Yeah. yeah, you know you know what they say about opinions. So anyhow, um, the, that's, that's the problem because uh, a lot of uh, landscaping companies that I see here uh, in my area they they aren't concerned about the quality, you know, if they're uh, bidding to specifications or they're uh, they're working with a residential client and they've set up a uh, a, um, a specification book to what to, uh, how their crew should install everything. They basically no. send their crew out and say, "Do it as fast as you can and as cheap as you can." Oh, geez, and that's yeah, that is a big yeah. problem and um, because. I, yeah. We want yeah. to be known as a better industry. Right. We want to be known as professionals. Yes. And if you go to like Facebook has a landscape contractor uh, uh, forum or or there's group. lots of them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I I belong to one. And you see a lot of these people uh, asking questions. They they are have a landscaping business. I guess they have a license. I'm not sure, but they're asking questions. Um, about things they should already know. So, well, and I, uh, good point. A good. Uh, is it because? Sorry, so many questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. No problem. Is we'll it because? It is it because? Um, they don't. They don't know how to cost the. You know, are they? Do you? And I know we're assuming some things, but yeah. like, if they if they want it done cheaply, is it because? They've underestimated the cost of how to do it right. Well, that, that's or, a good point. That's or good is point. it that they don't know how to do it right and therefore estimate? You know, it's that, a chicken and another, egg thing. No, it's <laughs> it's both. Both 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 things can be true. Okay. So, so the thing is, is that they don't know how to estimate because that's a skill unto itself, and that takes years to learn. Yeah. So. Um, and the other thing is, is that they look at getting the job instead of doing the job. Uh -huh. You follow on me? Yeah. So there, it's about winning the job, and that makes them maybe underestimate the right. real time, and and also um, accounting for contingency. Yeah. So let me ask you a question: When sure. you were working as a contractor, how did you estimate your labor? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it is interesting because um, I started out way too low. Um, I would try to calculate the amount, being an engineer mm -hmm. as a background, I mm -hmm. would try to calculate how much soil we would remove and how many skips we would need. And mm -hmm. I was never, I never amounted, I never, you know, could figure out the exact amount. I was always too low. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, so then I would add thirty percent, and then I was right. always, and then I was no. too low, and then I'd add yeah. another thirty percent. No, no <laughs> you, you don't. So let me let me express how I do it. Okay. Yeah. So, good. um, because uh, I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, disparage how you did things, but let me tell you how I did it and how I learned to do it. Right. Yeah. So when when I was in forestry, um, I actually had a, a a friend that was really smart, and he would uh, I'd go to him for advice all the time, and um, and so I said, well, you know, I I I need to learn how to do this. What should I do? He said, well, the first thing you have to do is learn how to estimate per man hour. So how mm. long does it take one man? You know, I'm I'm I'm. I'm using a generic pronoun. Um, uh, how long per person? Does it yeah. yeah. <laughs> how long does it take one person? You know, well, in the industry, it's called man hours. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, so how long does it take one person to do this task? So, in other words, if you're laying paver a paver patio, how long? How many square feet per hour can one person do? 
And yeah. does that, uh, it, it, do you want to break it out into how long, how long does it take to do the, um, to the, to do the base? How long does it take to actually set the pavers, et cetera? Yeah. Or you can do it. Okay. Base takes so long. Pavers take so long. So it's, uh, it's X number of man hours per, uh, per paver, which includes the base work and so forth. So you can break it out in, in different, um, in, in different segments. But, yeah. But that said, that's where you have to start. Okay, so if you have 30 yards of gravel to move, how are you moving it? Are you moving it with a skid steer? Machine are you moving or, are you, yeah. Uh, are you moving it with a conveyor truck? How you, how are you placing that soil? Okay, so if you have a pile of soil and you have to move and you have a machine that has a bucket that says let's say can you can move a half a yard at a time. Okay? So from the point of where the where your pile is, you know, where for your uh, where your your material where your, is, yeah, yeah, where your material is yarded at, to the actual uh, site itself. How long does it take? Five minutes to get uh, to move that that uh, half a yard, ten yeah. minutes, whatever. You have to you have to be able to understand that. Yeah. Then every once, every mechanic of the job, yeah, every mechanical every me part. Then then you have to understand how long does it take to grade it out either with a machine or with a, 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 a with tools or whatever how many hours uh, man hours are it going to take to do that how many man hours are going to take you to screed it per yeah. you know per how many man hours now the only way to you can use a cheat book you know the means labor uh, book you know but that's a national average and necessarily doesn't represent uh, what what your workforce can do okay yeah. Because each area has different work, you know, workforce uh, uh, abilities. You know, some areas where people are, are highly skilled, or other areas where you don't hardly have any skilled people. So, um, so once you once you, but the best way to do that is actually do the work yourself. So I've laid thousands and thousands of square feet of paper pavers. I know how long it takes me on my knees to lay a paver to lay one square foot of paver. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to have uh, is to keep track of your labor hours and get a report at the end of the job and see where see where your actuals versus your estimates are. And then you can adjust. Oh, OK. It took them four more hours to do this uh, uh, 200 square foot of paver than I estimated. OK, so now I'm going to adjust my labor hours for man hours. Also, you have to take in the site condition. Are we able to move the pavers right next to the work area, or do we have to bring them from the front of the house to the back of the house by yeah uh, and double handle? <laughs> yeah. So, like you were saying before, it's very complex. Yeah. For the timid. Oh, you cut out there for a minute. Can you yeah. repeat that? I I was saying this type of work is so complex; it's not for the timid. Yeah, you're right. You, you have to have guts and you have. The other thing is, is you have to be willing to learn and you're constant. I'm still taking classes on stuff. Yeah. Well, I have to, to get to continue education hours for my license. But even if I didn't, I still would because well, I'm, yeah. I'm paid for my level of expertise. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so now we only have. um about an hour for each podcast. I'm thinking we need to maybe follow this up with some others with you um, right. because we have so much to cover, but let's, let's maybe try in the next um, five or 10 minutes to sure. yeah. say, so what is have, your recommendation I, for, you know, we want to help people um, right. and, and, but the first um step is they need to know that they need help right right well the thing being is is that if you're in this business uh it's a constant learning curve you're never done learning uh i've been yeah. doing this for 30 years and i'm still learning there's new things that come out new scientific information comes out about plants soils whatever um yeah so you're constantly learning the the best way to start in this business is first learn about soils then learn about irrigation, then learn about plants. Yeah. So uh, once you have expertise in those levels, then you have to build on that. <clears throat> so uh, I've, I've been doing this for a lot. I've learned a lot. 
And so I want to pay it forward. So if I have some 20 something or 30 something starting out in this business, I want to make sure they start out right. And they, uh, they benefit from my years of knowledge and experience and learning this. So to me, it's my way of paying back. That's awesome. That, that's how I got started. People helped me like that when I got yeah. started. So to well, me, and- I, I want, I, you know, I kind of want to, that's why we're doing this. Cause I wanted to share. I love it. I love it. And I think that, um, Let's talk more on a follow-up podcast um, and right. and talk about issues because, you know, I, th- I think it's it's great to say, oh, we love this industry. It's so great. Um, I want to go that next step and say, right. but we're not where we need to be. Exactly. Because and, one, one, thing, one thing I want to interject in here sure. is we're not as green as we should be. We, uh, yeah. you know, uh, mowing one acre of lawn is like driving 10 miles in your car. Oh, good point. Okay. Good analogy. Okay. We use yeah. a lot of chemicals, chemical fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides. We use a lot of stuff that pollute the groundwater and so forth. We need to clean up our industry, to be honest with you. Now, that yeah. said, we, we're switching to ba- battery operated equipment as soon as they as soon as the battery technology gets to a point where we think oh this will work for us we get it uh, for instance we have all of our hand tools you know power tools are all milwaukee battery operated tools awesome awesome well i have a um a seminar from sync live we're getting the videos ready and one yeah. of those <clears throat> is battery versus gas and right. the pros and cons and how we have some business owners committing to to electric and what they're doing and why right. and then we have right. people that are saying what you know what still left to figure out so right. um i'm excited to to roll the, that out soon yeah. um later the, in march so the fossil the fossil fuel guys are going to have to change because the technology yeah. is getting better and uh, it is. States, states and cities and counties are putting in ordinances against those machines because they're so polluting. Yeah. Um, so they're going to have to make the change sooner or later. So it's just some will come readily and some will come kicking and screaming. <laughs> That's always the case, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> You change know, if, is hard you know yeah, it's change not is hard. easy right I, i've got a landscape architect here i can't get him to change the way he does irrigation he's still <laughs> using shrub sprays which you go back to his job four or five years later and the shrub sprays are all blocked oh my gosh no okay. no and just think real quick just think if you have to water a shrub with a spray you're losing 40 percent of that water to evaporation or to or to uh, um, atomization. Yeah, yeah. If you're using a drip system, especially a subsurface drip system, you don't lose any of that water. Yeah, it's all going and, where you put it. Right. Yeah. And his his comment is, well, I want to see where the water's going. Oh. <laughs> That's why I use shrub sprays. <laughs> but guess what? If you have a shrub, let's say um, uh, a ceanothus, let's say. Um, and you uh, not the ground cover, the uh, the, the, you shrub, know, the, the the shrub, yeah, the shrub. I can't remember the full well, scientific we, name. Uh, yeah, we call that have, um, California lilac. Yeah, California that, lilac. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a common name. Well, that shrub has a really massive root system. You have to water down at least six to eight inches to get enough water down to the root system. Yeah. So how long do you think you have to run that shrub spray when 40% <laughs> of the water is atomizing and then has to fall down on the ground? How long do you think you have to water that? Yeah. So that's a rhetorical Not question. very efficient. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> well, Gary, this has been so great. I'm, yeah, just don't mean to cut you off, but we no. need to close out this issue. And right. we're going to book some more time with you. Chapter let's, two. Let's, let's do chapter two next. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I, yeah, thanks for reading our publication. Thanks yeah. for reaching out. Yeah. Thanks for, for giving yeah. back to the community. Yes. Yeah, so and- Angel- Angelique, uh, if you get a chance, go to my website, GaryKrauseLandscaping.com and read my blog. I will do. Awesome. And, and then let me know what you think. <laughs> this is just the start, Gary. Let's yeah. talk more. Awesome. Yeah. Thank I you. Love- 
I love what you're doing with the magazine and everything. I, I think it's great. It's um, it's overdue. Your your type of publication is overdue. So, uh, and it's Thank very you. informative. It's very informative. So you get a big atta girl for doing what you do. <laughs> Well, we're just getting started. So, yeah. That's good to Pe hear. People like you giving back and helping steer us that we're right. definitely giving giving what needs to be given. Um right. and and spreading the word. That's that's what keeps us going. So, right. um Exactly. And it's people like you that uh, facilitate that. Yes. Yes, but without people giving, we we can't yeah. Do yeah, it. You have, so you have to yeah. you have to share knowledge. You know, uh, knowledge is wisdom. It is, and it it deserves to be shared. We need we need a better industry. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. And, I'm glad you and I feel the same way about that. And it, I, I don't mean it in a disparaging way. I mean it in a way that we're we're trying to actively help that. Um, right. So yeah, let's let's do it. Because I, I feel our industry is an important part of uh, um, uh, uh, enhancing the environment we live in. Without mm. landscaping, we'd just pave everything over. <laughs> yeah. That's how stupid humans are. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, let's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, yeah, well, maybe... good, way to, good way to end it, Angela. Good way, yeah. <laughs> All right, Gary, this it's been a pleasure. And yeah, you bet. Let's book the next one. Absolutely. Have a great day and talk yeah, to you, you soon. Okay. You betcha. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.